It's time for our Wednesday webinar, and I'm Dr. Gerilyn Brosfield at Exo Health, and today we are talking about collagen. So I am hoping that this is a topic that feels relevant to you, and if you think about all of the different marketing that we're exposed to and all of the different protein sources since we're trying to balance our blood sugar and um, help ourselves have even insulin levels um, with proteins, it becomes confusing sometimes when we start to think about what proteins should I use and what quality of um, you know, protein sources are really the best. And so I wanna talk specifically about collagen today because it's become exceedingly popular recently and I have lots of people asking me about collagen. So I wanna talk a little bit about some of the pros and cons and what it is and how to choose. So give me just a moment, I'm gonna start our slides and um, we'll get to the topic and then there'll be time for questions and answers and specifics at the end of our discussion as well. I'm Dr. Gerilyn Brosfield at Exo Health, and thank you for joining us today to talk about collagen protein. In some ways, more than other um, protein sources that might be from plant sources, I tend to think of our animal sources of protein as the most important to be sure that we have really high quality um, in regards to. And so I wanna talk about collagen and say, well, what's the big deal and why are, why are we sort of now thinking that we have more issues with collagen? Is, there a, is it all good or is there some, um, you know, some issues with it or are we good to go and clear with collagen? So when I look at collagen, you know, we kind of have always heard, I don't know if you've heard this in the past, but that chicken soup is something we all should eat when we're sick. Um, it's kind of, I have used to think it was an old wives tale, and then as I've learned more about some of the actual mysteries of chicken soup, there's some real reasons that it's a phenomenal food as a healing food. And certainly in our society, as the paleo diet has become a, um, a big deal and a lot of people are eating a paleo diet, bone broth sort of started to gain notoriety as a really healing food and has been a great um, you know, greatly touted, and there's there's now multiple companies making bone broth. If you walk through the grocery store, you can buy bone broth in a version, um, you know, many versions, frozen or fresh or all kinds of ways. And collagen is sort of discussed as having all these benefits, and many of us know that in different cultures, there's almost some mysteries around um, collagen sources that might be beneficial and that that might actually provide healing to the body. So what is collagen? We've all heard of it. You know, when I ask that question, the first thing that comes to my mind is injecting collagen, and that's not as popular now um, that there are some other fillers that work well. But collagen is a protein fiber that is, it makes up about a third of the protein in our body. And most collagen in our body is in long, thin fibrils or little strands that are packed together and they sort of support each other, almost like a scaffold or a um, bridge, holding our tissue together and making our tissue elastic and strong and, and giving us the structure, even the curvature of our skin or um, the way that the uh, folds of our skin occur are due to collagen. And there are a lot of types of collagen. There are at least 16 types of collagen, but the types that are really the most in the human body, in fact, make up almost 90% of our human collagen are types one, two, and three. And type one, you think of as sort of tendons. It's firm, it's not necessarily so stretchy, it's just really strong. And in fact, type one collagen can be stronger than steel even. So it's an extremely strong um, scaffold or um, bridging mechanism. It's kind of like the two by fours holding up the house. Um, it's strong, it provides firmness to the skin and the structure of the skin and is particularly high in tendons. Type two collagen is mainly in our joints. It's mostly cartilage. And so I think of collagen in this form a little bit like padding or you know the old sponges that when they're when they get dry they become hard and kind of shrunken um, that's more like type 2 collagen it needs to be plumped up um, with other things that are its cofactors 
but it is in our joints, um, padding between bones and in other places where it provides padding. And then type three collagen is also in our skin and it's the type that can be plumped up and provide sort of a youthful look or um, more of the, the texture of skin being soft and, and more hydrated almost appearing. So there are a lot of sources of collagen. It does not come from plants. It is always from animals and because it's a protein that is um, created in a body of an animal. And it, so there are um, cow sources, pig sources, fish sources, and eggshells. Um, the membrane on the eggshells can also be harvested to make collagen supplements from. Of these four kinds, the reason the marine uh, collagen, the fish collagen, may be the most available to our body is that it's in smaller particles, so it's easier to absorb and utilize in the human body. So when when we're born and, you know, maybe up till age 20 when we've got these bodies that are functioning incredibly well, um, collagen makes up about 90% of our bone mass and about a third of the total proteins in our body. And we build new collagen, like we're continually making new collagen up until the age of 25. And then we actually begin losing collagen. And it's not that we stop making it entirely, it's just that we don't make it faster than we use it. And so we start to have an overall loss of collagen after the age of 25 of about 1.5% per year. And by the time we're 60, we've lost about half of our collagen stores. And so we're depleted or we are less than um, we had when we were say 25 um, by the time we're 60 and in our collagen quantities. So why do we care? Um, you know, certainly pain would be the first thing I would say. When people start to have arthritic pain in their joints, that's one of the things that we notice as collagen is not as, um, you know, plumped up and padding as well in our joints. We start to have pain. Also joint function, just literally the, um, you know, the movement of a joint is facilitated by the collagen in that joint. And collagen regeneration, where in our skin, for instance, we start to see wrinkles and we start to see changes in our skin quality um, of it not being as plumped up and not as elastic. Those are collagen changes that, you know, we start to notice as our body has less collagen stores. Our wounds don't heal as easily. And certainly we sometimes scar more later in life than when we're very young. And then sometimes collagen as a protein source is something that some people will seek it out for because they're trying to find more um, bioavailable protein sources and it also is sought after for its anti-aging properties and i kind of would say you know vanity is a pretty strong driver in this whole list you know i think we all know what collagen is primarily because it originally was um, you know touted and advertised and talked about and has been used in skincare regimens um, really to try and regenerate collagen or make us look younger. So if you th look at this picture, one of the things I want to illustrate here, if you look at the white strands that look like a, a line of, of little circles attached to each other or a long caterpillar, those white strands represent collagen. Um, in young skin, collagen fibrils are intact in their whole length. In other words, they stay like a long structural fiber that provides good strength under the skin and helps us not have wrinkles and to have more elasticity and more plumpness. But as we lose collagen and we don't make it as fast as we use it up as we get older, we start to have spaces between the structures. And so instead of a really strong structure underneath, just like you know, inside a house, if, if you started to knock out two by fours from the walls, the house, the the roof would start to sag. Well, that's what happens to our skin as well. So when we don't have the strong structure underneath with the collagen fibrils, we tend to have changes in our skin. But imagine not just your skin, imagine this being other tissues in the body, um, a joint for instance, where there's padding in that joint and now you have padding that's not as consistently thick and even throughout a joint space. It's because those collagen fibrils are not as strong and not as contiguous or not as long as they've been in the past. And this sort of fits with one of the reasons we think collagen is reasonable to take. If we put collagen, if I just 
took this skin and I put a whole bunch of collagen under that skin where there are lacking pieces, amazingly, the body can reorganize collagen ingredients back into new collagen. So that's one of the key things as to why we're talking about this is because there's been great myths and then great advances in science about how we can incorporate collagen into our systems. The theory, um, and this is you know, based on lots of studies, and certainly in reading some of these studies, it's interesting to read how there's been all kinds of ways of looking at what we can do to more effectively help collagen get back into our system. So as we um, go about life, collagen is constantly broken down and reassembled in our bodies. But it sort of is a recycling mission like our body reuses the ingredients that are still active. And so there's a constant recycling of what we do have that are the active ingredients of collagen. And if we provide more ingredients to the body, whether that's in the form of vitamins or proteins, we're able to make more collagen than we were if we were not doing that additional pour in of more collagen and more vitamins and nutrients. So collagen in our diet, taking it in by mouth, actually increases the production and regeneration or that um, sort of makes, it's like dumping a lot of extra ingredients into the recycling process means you can make more of the original compound. Um, the existing places that there's collagen in the body act like a, um, the medical world word is nidus, but they act like a scaffold or a guide or a structure for more collagen to attach and deposit in those locations. So in that slide with the face and the skin, if you imagine being able to add collagen in there and attach it to the broken pieces of collagen, you would end up shoring up against some of those wrinkles or the sagging of the skin. And we think the same thing happens in the joints, for instance, when there's a little bit of collagen there, that'll draw for more depositing of collagen into that joint and for re, um, regeneration of collagen padding in that space. One of the things that I thought was so cool is that collagen is adaptable. So we've heard that genes can be adaptable, like genes get impacted by our environment and actually get changed in a field we're studying now called epigenetics. But collagen is also magic in this way. And it's as if the collagen materials are smart. They can adapt their properties in response to things we do. So mechanical forces that might pull or push on an area that has collagen in it, those mechanical forces actually get converted in the collagen into biochemical signals that can control processes like wound healing or tissue remodeling. So some of us have heard, for instance, that we should massage areas after sur certain surgical healing has, at least like if the skin is closed after surgery, we've heard, okay, we should massage over that scar tissue. Well, this is partly why. Um, by massaging over the collagen, you'll actually change the way that wound heals um, and lays out its collagen and its healing properties. Or for instance, if I was um, training and I had, had an, a tendon that wasn't as strong, but I started training appropriately with appropriate physiologic movements, I could actually increase the strength of a tendon by doing physical training. So collagen is sort of a chameleon in that it can change from its existing structure to a stronger or, um, or change shape structure. There's a lot of ways we can get collagen into our system. Gelatin is a version of collagen. And so certainly gelatins are one option. Um, bone broth would be another. Collagen powders seem rampant. This is what I started having a, a wave of people coming in. I think there are now not only many options that you can buy online or at the shelves at the health food stores, but there are also now bars and um, other foods made with collagen powder um, in them. Meat actually has collagen in it. Animal products are what give us collagen. So meat has collagen in it. Um, things like bones and tendons, which are used to make bone broth, are high in collagen as well. And in fact, with the meat story, it's interesting. Um, certainly people who eat meat have a higher innate intake of collagen than a vegetarian would. Collagen supplements are available, and then specialty foods that are made with collagen. So sort of designer um, 
collagen foods are also available. So when we're looking at our own innate amount of collagen, if I think I have, you know, a sort of like a bucket that's three quarters of the way full of collagen when, when I start out, how do I lose more of it faster? What makes it disappear quicker? And certainly age is one of the things that happens to damage collagen because our breakdown of collagen is faster than our rebuilding of collagen. One of the main things that we can control um, for many of us who have already chosen, for instance, to be, to be um, appropriate with our sun use and have avoided smoking, the main thing you can control in addition to that is your, your sugar consumption. So when we have high sugar consumption, we get glycosylation or glycation products. And this AGE means glycosylation end products um, or glycated is another word. Anything with the GLY, like gly, glycated means that there's been sugar that changed that molecule. So when there's an end product that is changed by sugar, it's as if there becomes a little clump of sugar that can lodge itself out in the furthest tiniest little capillaries and cause congestion. And that sugar consumption and those high glycosylated end products end up ends up damaging our collagen and making it harder for the body to regenerate and heal. Um, and autoimmune disorders tend, there are some that are very specifically about collagen. It's as if that's where the body attacks itself in those, in those specific autoimmune disorders. So when we talk about preventing collagen loss, like some of the things we can do now, one is protection from UV damage. And I'll just put a caveat in here. Many of you know because of our conversations about vitamin D that I really think we should get some sun. Um, for instance, getting 20 minutes of full sun exposure um, in the middle of the day is really beneficial for building vitamin D in our body. But there's a level beyond which we should not tread. And that is really when we start to develop redness and um, sunburn, um, which correlates with UV damage. Like when we get burnt, we're already past the point of damage. And so protecting from prolonged sun exposure is a reasonable thing to do, either with your clothing or a non, um, a non damaging kind of sunscreen. Um, usually something more like a blocker like zinc would be safer. And then another method, hydration, is a really easy thing that just has so many benefits. It's just as though, you know, we can't say enough about getting adequate hydration. So water, um, coconut water, as long as there's not added sugar in it, um, making green tea, lots of the no calorie drinks, as long as they're not full of chemicals, would be great ways to, to hydrate. Um, and many of you can almost recite this back to me that you need to drink half your weight in ounces of water. So if I weigh 200 pounds, I need to be drinking 100 ounces of water daily um, in an optimal situation. And you can go above that, that's just a minimum. The other thing about preventing collagen loss is to be sure that you're getting plenty of its cofactors because in order for collagen to regenerate itself or to recycle itself, or to be incorporated if you're taking it as a supplement, you have to have these vitamins in your system. So, vi and these, I've listed the food sources next to the vitamins. You can certainly take these vitamins as a vitamin, um, but also in your diet, making sure that you have a really varied diet where you're getting lots of different colors of fruits and vegetables will help you get these cofactors. Um, so strawberries, citrus peppers are um, high in vitamin C. Magnesium, like the dark chocolate on this list, um, nuts, seeds, and spinach and avocado all have magnesium. The anthocyanidins are the special um, phytonutrients in berries and red fruits, so those are great in all the blues and red berries. Um, copper in meats and nuts, and then vitamin A, which can come either from our orange plants, like a sweet potato or a yellow squash or a carrot, and also from animal products, we get vitamin A. These are two examples that um, are collagens that I use at my house, and I'm going to explain a little bit why I use each one, but I, I think when, one of the things you want to be sure you do is start looking for really um, high-quality collagens.
So why did I say that there might be a con or a negative to collagen? Um, mainly because of this, there's a potential for kidney stones. So I wanna talk about that because this really has become a guide for me on how I advise the use of collagen and I think is a good safety um, point for us as far as what we ought to do um, so that we don't end up with some other unintended consequence of doing something good. So collagen is made up of amino acids that are bound to a structural protein called hydroxyproline. So hydroxyproline is sort of like the, um, the scaffolding or the structure that hangs all of the proteins on it to make up a, a molecule of collagen. And molecules of collagen and hydroxyproline just innately by themselves, for instance, if I took bone broth and said, let me take a molecule of of collagen out of this bone broth, um, it will be very large, relatively speaking. It will be in the 300 kilodalton area of size, which I can't quite comprehend that, but all I can tell you is it's a bigger small particle. It's still something smaller than what you and I might um, be, need a microphone or microscope to look at, but it is still quite small. However, when you, um, think about how collagen gets broken down from that molecule of collagen and hydroxyproline, the collagen has to separate itself from the hydroxyproline in order to get reabsorbed and recycled into your system to be used. And the um, hydroxyproline that gets separated off gets changed into oxalate as your body metabolizes it and tries to put it through its steps of um, utilization. Well, oxalate is then concentrated in your kidney system and when you have oxalate in your kidneys or your bladder, it can combine with calcium and make kidney stones. So it's interesting, the different forms of collagen that we can take in. So for instance, bone broth as compared to a collagen supplement, bone broth will tend to be larger molecules of collagen because it's less broken down. And in some ways, that's one of the reasons the marine collagen seems to be a little better absorbed is it has less, um, the molecule sizes are smaller to begin with, and so there's less of the hydroxyproline in the system. But if we look at this scenario and say, okay, what on earth are we supposed to do with this case um, and with this knowledge? It's really, it becomes about quality, and I'm gonna give you a couple examples. Um, when we look for quality on collagen, like any animal product type supplement, we're gonna want um, to be sure that it's coming from healthy animals. and what I mean when I say that is you don't want to take the lowest, you don't want the blue light special on your collagen. If you're going to spend a little money on a higher quality supplement, supplements that come from animals are the place to spend that. So you want to be sure that this is coming from grass fed cows that have been raised in a country that has really high quality standards. I feel, um, fairly secure, I guess I would say in saying that, sources of animal products that come, for instance, from New Zealand are thought to meet the highest quality. The New Zealand laws basically about how animal products can be curated in their country help make sure that we have higher quality of animal products. So New Zealand is a good source. Um, and you don't want to just go buy your collagen protein at the dollar store. You, you want to be sure that you're getting it from a reputable company. You want to buy it from a company that does rigorous testing. So you need to know that they've tested for the um, quality of the product. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about a guide for rigorous testing on any supplement. And then you want to pick a collagen that has better bioavailability. So not that I wouldn't use a beef um, collagen, I do, but I would also say know that particle size equals bioavailability. So if you can find a company that has smaller particle sizes in their collagen, that's better. And you want to also be sure you're getting the cofactors um, in order to utilize the collagen that you're using. One of the main points is to say, let's use collagen as a supplement, not as a replacement for your protein sources. So many of us keep you know, a bottle of protein powder or two in our cupboard. I keep one that's a whey protein of grass-fed, um, cold-pressed whey protein in my cupboard. And I also have collagen protein in my cupboard. Um, and there's different advantages to either of those. I also have a plant-based protein for my vegan daughter. Um, so 
different advantages to each of those. And one of the advantages of collagen is that it dissolves so easily, like a, a good quality collagen protein um, supplement will actually dissolve into my coffee without really altering the taste or consistency, um, or a soup or a cold smoothie. You can put it in anything. Um, Robert has been stirring his collagen supplement into some water and just drinking it. It doesn't taste unpleasant. So thinking of a collagen advantage, it's that one of them is that it also dissolves really easily into whatever um, you're drinking or eating. But what I would like to emphasize is if you're using a collagen powder that's a protein powder, so like the Bulletproof um, or Dr. Axe or Vital Proteins or um, Pure Protein, any of those companies, those collagen protein powders are fairly large particle sizes. And so you would want to think of those as one serving of protein in your day, not something you would do three to five times a day in a protein shake. So I have tended and the literature supports using, you know, maybe one serving of collagen protein as a protein substitute. So maybe you have 22 grams of protein um, from your collagen powder and you let that be your protein in your morning shake. That seems fine, but more than that is probably pushing it from the standpoint of safety because about 10% of us are already prone to kidney stones. And so avoiding excessive use of collagen as your protein source is a reasonable thing to do to prevent that. What's interesting is the effective dose of collagen. If we're going to say, what's the amount of collagen that I should take every day to get help, but not cause any harm? That amount is five grams. All of the studies look like up to five grams. So between 2.5 and five grams doesn't have an impact on increasing risk of um, kidney stones but does get the maximal regeneration and recycling capacity of the body with collagen. So these two examples, just to give you a reference, and I um, don't know why there's purple marks on my page. I'm sorry about that. Looking at these two collagens kind of illustrates two very different uses. The Bulletproof Collagen Protein, and I, I'm not endorsing this company as far as I don't have any um, financial connections, but in using this particular collagen protein, it is great because it stirs into things really easily, but you can see that that serving, which is two scoops of that um, collagen protein on the left, would be really the max amount a person might want to use in a day. So that would be one way a person could get one serving of protein in, in a way that was very easy to incorporate into their oatmeal or their coffee or a smoothie in a day. The other side, this orthomolecular products collagen is actually what I sell in my office and I have partnered with this company because of their stringent testing. So this particular collagen is unique in the market because instead of being the 300 to 600 kilodalton size that the other protein powders are on the market, this one is less than um, 30. So when you look at size of particle, this one has already been broken down to be very bioavailable and not have it um, extra hydroxyproline in it. And it comes in a little tiny scoop or with a little tiny scoop that one scoop is your serving for the day at five, um, five grams. So that is the version I actually recommend if someone's taking collagen specifically for joint pain or for cellular regeneration or wound healing or trying to prevent hair loss or um, you know build stronger skin and nails um, or help their osteoarthritis. Certainly, and even rheumatoid arthritis, for instance, has studies showing benefit by using collagen. So from a standpoint of trying to achieve a specific end, I would use something like this orthomolecular product. This is the only one I know of on the market with the small, small particle sizes, but I would use that in a five gram dose daily to achieve the best um, regenerative effect you could for joints or wound healing or skin um, maintenance. So just as our last slide, I want to just talk for a minute about selecting quality supplements. Um, one of the most important things about selecting supplements is that you get what you expect to get. So I don't know, I, I think probably a lot of us have read articles where 
a testing agency will go on to the into a grocery store and test you know six different olive oils on the shelf and tells you which brands didn't actually have 100% olive oil in the jar even though they say 100% virgin olive oil um, or you know how different companies sometimes have thinned down the product that's what it says what said what the label says is not exactly what is in the bottle so with vitamins and supplements it's a bit of the wild west because the regulation of vitamins and supplements is different than drugs as long as they're not making a claim to treat a specific disease they can be um, regulated as a supplement and the laws are much more vast and lenient about supplements so you end up having to rely on what you can investigate of companies and what they are telling you they do and how they are validated by third parties to do what they do. So what you want to do is find a company and I will tell you, I literally, um, this is one of the things I pour over um, quality information about companies and multiple different companies from the standpoint of selecting whatever I'm going to endorse or sell in my office or purchase for my family. and. So that orthomolecular is a good example of a company that is, has the highest levels of stringency. stringency. And you wanna find companies like that to utilize. So these tests on this list are what I go by. I wanna know that the company has tested their raw materials to know that they are getting what they bought. So if XYZ company buys um, vitamin C, they need to test and be sure they got what they bought. So they have to test for the identity of the, of the product. They need to test for the potency of the product. If they're making a bottle that says 500 milligrams of vitamin C, they need to test and be sure they're putting 500 milligrams in each serving. And then purity, they need to also test that there's no contamination and cross-contamination can happen in their manufacturing process, which is why their manufacturing steps are important, or it can happen because they bought a, um, poor quality product or a product that was contaminated. Cross-contamination often will happen if a company doesn't do really good cleaning between their supplement um, manufacturing. And probably the most important thing to me that I can tell from either reading a company's endorsements by their third-party testers or their own declarations of what they do, and then looking at the bottle, is stability testing and expiration date. Stability testing means that they test that product, and for instance, some of the companies, Orthomolecular is one and um, Allergy Research Group is another, they test their products every six months to see how that product degrades while it sits on the shelf, and then they set their, expirations date, their expiration dates so that they know that when the expiration date occurs, that product is still at the potency that's written on the bottle. So expiration date testing is what you want. And then the last very simple thing that I would do every time you buy a bottle of vitamins, if it's any vitamin that has B vitamins in it, you want to look and see if they've got folic acid or folate in that vitamin. If the vitamin company is using folic acid, what they're doing is ignoring the fact that 44% of Americans cannot convert folic acid, which is synthetic folate, into active form folate. And that ignorance is not bliss. That means they're selling vitamins that are going to be ineffective to half of the population and, in fact, cause them some decreased health because folic acid will compete for the good kind of folate that they're getting even in their diet if it's not in that pill. So I just look to see if there's, a, if there's folic acid in the vitamin, I don't buy from that company. Um, I just look for companies that use folate because that way it's more usable to the end consumer. And it seems like a... Um, sort of like a little litmus test of quality and investigation and scientific knowledge um, of that company. So I'll throw one under the bus. I had a patient bring Centrum Silver in and say, can I take this as a multivitamin? And I said, nope, you can't. Um, not only did that person have an MTHFR mutation, but the Centrum Silver did, you know, has folic acid in it and has some other vitamins in it that are not the highest quality form. And so that's not a good option. Um, so I hope that this list, even if collagen's not your question, if you're just even thinking about how to select suppl supplements, this list may help you. I invite you to partner with us at ExoHealth. This is one of the things we pride ourselves in doing so that we're providing you recommendations and um, options that are high quality and have had expiration date testing and um, 
know that with collagen, certainly using those smaller particle collagens, working with us to decide if it's a good thing for you to use or not, and limiting your use of it as a protein supplement to one serving a day would be your safety mechanisms. Thank you for listening through our presentation and I'll move over to our question and answers.